Millions of species call our planet home, and some are pretty strange. So how do we organize it all? How would you classify something like this? Let's figure it out together in this episode, all about classification. I'm obsessed with animals. Here are some of my favorites. The axolotl and the sea sheep and the bush baby. Some of these organisms definitely look like animals, but others are more confusing. What makes us categorize them as an animal in the first place and not a plant or a fungus, for example? Taxonomy is the science of classifying and naming species to better understand relationships between living things. Classifying is arranging things into groups based on shared qualities or characteristics. Imagine you had the coolest playroom in the world, toys of every kind. Now imagine you had to organize all of these toys, find a special place to put them with other toys that were similar. But here's the catch. You have to share this playroom full of toys with everyone in the world. And what's even more challenging is that you have to agree how to organize everything. Sounds pretty impossible. This is similar to the challenge that scientists face when classifying and organizing living things. Much of the credit for starting a formal classification goes to Carl Linnaeus. Linnaeus decided not to just group animals into species. He noticed that several species had similarities and should belong to larger groups called genuses. This continued level after level added until we were left with a system similar to the one we use today. Carl Linnaeus and his fellow scientists had very limited information to use when classifying these organisms. The information that they had really stopped at what they could observe with the naked eye. This means that they didn't know about detailed cell structure differences or DNA. So they didn't know anything about genetic relationships that now can determine how we categorize organisms. As we learn more about DNA, how we classify organisms will continue to change. The system looks like a reverse pyramid, organized from least specific at the top to most specific at the bottom, one type of organism, like our bush baby. We'll come back to this guy in a bit. Let's start at the top. The most inclusive groups are domains. There are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The domain bacteria is full of bacteria. Just stay with me, it gets more complicated. They are prokaryotes and therefore have characteristics like no nucleus, no membrane bound organelles. These are organisms with non-complex cell structures. This domain can include bacteria fixing nitrogen in the soil or helping with decomposition. Also bacteria that make you sick or bacteria hanging out in your intestines, helping you digest that milkshake from lunch. Archaea are prokaryotes too, but they have some major DNA and structure differences that give them their own domain. Some like extreme salt environments or extreme temperatures, for example. Organisms that defy the typical limits that living things have are in this domain. The third domain, eukarya, are eukaryotes. So they have complex cell structures like membrane bound organelles and DNA contained inside of a nucleus. Odds are, if you can see a living thing with your naked eye, it belongs to this domain. So the next level that is more specific than domains is the level of kingdom. We have already arrived at a level that can get confusing based on how the scientists are organizing. Organization at this level and really every other level is often changing. So much so that scientists are not in agreement that this current system is the best way to arrange things. Talk about drama. So for now, we're only going to focus on the eukaryotes. Fungi are heterotrophs, which means they get energy from consuming other organisms. Instead of consuming food like we do, they absorb nutrition from their surroundings. They do this mostly by secreting powerful enzymes that break down complex molecules into smaller organic compounds. Fungi are usually multicellular, but they can be unicellular. Most have cell walls made of chitin, the same material found in the exoskeletons of spiders, insects, and other arthropods. Fun fact, these guys were originally thrown in with the plants. 
which leads me to our next kingdom. Plantae, or plants, are autotrophs, which means they make their own food through a process called photosynthesis. Even the carnivorous plants still make their glucose from sunlight energy. Plants are multicellular and they have cell walls of cellulose. Animalia, or animals, are mostly multicellular heterotrophic organisms. This is the kingdom to which you belong. Lastly, there's protista. This kingdom is extremely diverse and there's often talk of dividing it because of how diverse it is. Let me explain. There are protists that are plant-like, and protists that are animal-like, and protists that are fungi-like, but they just don't make the cut to be in those kingdoms. It gets worse. Protista includes both autotrophic protists and heterotrophic protists. Most protists are unicellular, but they can be multicellular. I like to think that protista is like that one drawer in the kitchen that is full of stuff that doesn't really belong anywhere else. The junk drawer kingdom. As we continue down to the other hierarchy levels, we get less inclusive, therefore more specific. Moving down through an organism's phylum, class, order, family, genus, and finally to species. Each species has a scientific name. For example, our bush baby is actually called Galago senegalensis. So why do we care about these scientific names? Common names are complicated because they vary based on location, like our friend here. Its common name is the bush baby, which is way easier to say, but it's also called a galago and an agapes. Same animal, different names, but its scientific name is recognized no matter your location. Good old Carl Linnaeus gave us this naming system called binomial nomenclature. The two-part naming system uses Latin or Greek roots, which is why some are so difficult to say. The first name is the genus. The second name refers to one species in the genus. Let's quickly put what we've learned into practice. Now that we know the scientific name of the bush baby, let's figure out where he belongs in our taxonomic system. We are here at the most specific level, the species level. He is called a Galago senegalensis. So his species is G. senegalensis. And we know that the first part of the scientific name is for the genus, so that would be Galago. The family level is Galagidae, which have several species of bush babies. The order is primates, which includes lemurs and monkeys, gibbons, chimpanzees, gorillas, and even us humans. The class is mammalia, or mammals. These are organisms that have characteristics like producing milk for their offspring and are covered in hair or fur. Diverse organisms such as whales, polar bears, zebras, squirrels, and elephants are also in this class. The phylum is Chordata, which includes all organisms with a backbone, which are almost all larger organisms. Now we have arrived at Kingdom Animalia and Domain Eukarya. The next time you hear someone call a cathartora a buzzard, you can gently correct them by giving them the common name, turkey vulture, or just stick with that scientific name. And if you want to learn more science, you can check out this video next, actually called Galago Senegalensis. 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 Three, two,